Welcome to the Society of Professional Journalists video about fake news. This is part of the overall subject of media literacy and fake news and isn't meant to be all inclusive, but just to help get the conversation started. For more about media literacy and misinformation, check out our video, Misinformation. Your narrator on this video is Sacramento Bee reporter Tess Townsend. Hi there, this is Tess Townsend and I will be doing a presentation on fake news. Fake news is a term that became popular during the 2016 election to refer to misinformation online. Misinformation isn't a new thing. There's always been propaganda, people deliberately trying to mislead other people in order to get certain results. Um, people sharing information that they just don't realize isn't true. So it's not a new phenomenon, but it's something that showed up on social media in a way that we hadn't seen before you know, in such great volume with so much influence during the 2016 presidential election. Craig Silverman, um, who writes for BuzzFeed News, was one of the first people to really prominently use the term fake news. And um, a year after the 2016 election, he wrote a piece and appeared on television saying, you know, he didn't really like the term that much. He felt like it didn't have any meaning anymore. And so I'm going to share a clip from PBS NewsHour where Judy Woodruff, this is Judy Woodruff, interviewed Craig Silverman. So Craig Silverman, uh, BuzzFeed, you've, you've done a lot of thinking over the last several years and writing about fake news. You've used the term a lot. Um, what have you what have you seen? I mean, we, we quoted President Trump and his he's using that term again. But what do you see when you today compared to what you originally thought when you started using the term uh, a few years ago, fake news? How do you how do you see the the meaning of the term and what the distinctions are? Originally, for me, it was a term used to describe a very specific type of completely false, deceptive content that was spreading primarily on Facebook by people who wanted to earn money from the traffic that, that went back to their website that had the fake story. And so this was a specific time kind of actor, a malicious actor out there who was doing it for money. And yet now, here we are, you know, roughly a, a year past the election or, sh or so, and the term has really been, I think, co-opted, and it's almost like a jujitsu move that Donald Trump has done, where people were saying fake news was one of the things that kind of got him elected, and maybe people had been tricked by these stories, and he felt like that undermined the legitimacy of, of his election, so he decided to take the term and sort of make it in his own image. And so he uses it today to criticize reporting that he doesn't like, to criticize mostly mainstream outlets that he thinks are too hard on him. And I think, frankly, at this point, the term in some ways has become almost meaningless, or at the very least, it means whatever your side thinks it does. Instead of fake news, um, I think we should use the terms misinformation and disinformation for the sake of clarity. Misinformation is incorrect or misleading information. It may not be intentionally misleading, but it is misleading. Disinformation is a bit narrower. Disinformation refers to false information deliberately and often covertly spread, as by the planting of rumors, in order to influence public opinion or obscure the truth. We're going to review seven steps to identify misleading information. This comes from the News Literacy Project, which is a national nonprofit that creates resources for teachers and trains teachers to teach students about online information and how to verify that things are accurate. So first, check your emotions. What's your first reaction? Misinformation oftentimes plays on your emotions. Maybe it responds to an emotion it anticipates you to already be feeling, or maybe it's trying to stir an emotion in you. Determine the purpose of what you're watching or hearing. What's it supposed to look like? Is it supposed to appear to be a news report? Is it a news report? Is it satire? Um, is it something that's trying to potentially mislead you? Be aware of your biases. 
do you want the information to be true? Do you want it to be false? Consider the message. For example, is it too perfect? Is it too easy? Is it too alarmist? Um, if the message is extreme in any way, you should question it. Look for more information. Um, go online and see if other sources are saying the same thing as what you're reading in this particular source or if they're saying something that disagrees with it. Go deeper on the source. Um, look to see if you can find references to the source in other publications. Um, search the source's website. Is there an about page? Can you find contact information for the author of the piece? And go deeper on the content itself. How is the content written? Does the content include sources? How many sources? Uh, is it just citing one person or is it citing multiple people? Can you search for who it is citing? Does it just say like these experts and just say experts without any qualification? Or does it say like, you know, this person in this position of leadership at this particular institution? Um, you might also look for grammar. If the grammar is bad, um, you should question it. If there's inconsistencies, you should question it. If the formatting seems strange, you should question it. If there's random capitalization, you should question it. So let's apply that process to this piece of content from Facebook. This is um, a piece of content that I found not to be trustworthy about coronavirus. Now, the first thing I notice, um, and You'll see that I have the names crossed out because they're just regular people, but that's kind of the point. Um, this is coming from individuals who aren't, you know, experts as far as I know. Um, I went to this person's profile and it's just a bunch of videos of her lifting weights. Doesn't really make me think she's like some coronavirus expert. It's not like she's like a public figure and a doctor and stuff. She's just some person on the internet. And then there's also, notably, there's there's no links here. This doesn't take you to any other website. Um, it just says it's resharing, it's copy-pasted. Um, it could have been changed multiple times from when it was originally posted. Um, and that gets to the deeper thing, which is where does this originally come from? We have no idea. Now let's go deeper into the content. Um, I'm going to read this on, um, out loud. From members of the Stanford Hospital Board, this is their feedback for now on coronavirus. The new coronavirus may not show signs of infection for many days. How can one know if he or she is infected? By the time they have fever and or cough and go to the hospital, the lung is usually 50% fibrosis and it's too late. Taiwan experts provide a simple self-check that we can do every morning. Take a deep breath and hold your breath for more than 10 seconds. If you complete it successfully without coughing, without discomfort, stiffness, or tightness, etc., it proves there is no fibrosis in the lungs, basically indicates no infection. So first it says it's from the Stanford Hospital Board. So what I might do is Google whether the Stanford Hospital Board has said anything about the coronavirus or even if the Stanford Hospital Board, as they phrase it here, is a thing. Um, you know, Stanford... San there, there is a hospital associated with Stanford. Um, I don't know if they have a board that is called the Stanford Hospital Board. Um, and then looking for, in there's some inconsistencies here. For example, here, coronavirus is two words. And then here, it's one word. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and then um, some grammatical, the lung is usually 50% fibrosis. Um, that's that's not proper grammar. Um, it's also a really extreme claim and it doesn't have any um, real citation. Taiwan experts, who in Taiwan, what experts? They're not named, there's no institution. First they're talking about Stanford Hospital Board, now they're talking about Taiwan experts. And then they talk about a simple self-check. Okay, so simple, too easy too perfect. 
uh, there's a shortage or um, I don't know if there's a shortage of tests right now for coronavirus in the United States. It's hard for people to get tested. So if it were as simple as holding your breath to determine if you have it, then we wouldn't be in that predicament. Um, and then again, no fibrosis basically indicates no infection. That's really sweeping. Now, I'm not going to go through the entirety of the post, but I'm going to highlight these parts from it because um, they're going to play into the next slides that I show you. So serious, excellent advice by Japanese doctors. Again, like Taiwan experts, who? Who are they talking about? Take a few sips of water every 15 minutes at least. If you have a running nose and spot on, you have a common cold. This new virus is not heat resistant. This post happens to combine a bunch of different rumors that have already been debunked by Snopes. So we are going to apply the same news literacy project principles to uh, this article from Stat News. So Stat News is a publication you may not be familiar with. It's relatively new and also relatively niche. They cover medical science, public health, things like that. Um, however, it is a trustworthy site and this is a trustworthy article and I'm going to demonstrate to you how you can tell. So first let's start with Stat News, do they have an about page? They do, so that's something you can explore to learn more about them um, and you can follow those links and go to their social media and see that they have a footprint. Does this necessarily mean you should trust them? No, no one thing is enough. Just having an about page does not mean a site is trustworthy. It is, however, a positive signal. And so there's also some other things that you can explore on their website. So it is a developed website, so that's a positive signal. Now, another thing I'll do sometimes if I'm not familiar with the website is I'll look and I'll see if another publication has written about the website. Um, I might look at Columbia Journalism Review because they write about journalism outlets and we can see that Columbia Journalism Review has indeed written about STAT. I happen to know that recently the New York Times profiled STAT in a positive way. And just as a double check, if we go and we look at where they have hyperlinked to STAT News, it goes to the same website that we have been looking at. Now let's look at the article. It has a byline. That's a positive signal. Who is this person? Her name is Sharon Begley. Um, she has written for Reuters, Wall Street Journal, and Newsweek. Let's see if we can actually find that. Okay, so we can find that she has written for writers. Here's a clip she wrote for the Wall Street Journal. Here's her profile on Newsweek. So it would appear that this bio is accurate. Let's go to her Twitter. She's verified on Twitter. This means Twitter has made an effort to confirm that she is who she, who she says she is. That does not mean Twitter has confirmed the content she shares on her profile. Just because someone is verified on social media does not mean you can trust what they say. Verification does not mean the social media outlet is fact checking what this person says on the platform. It just means that they've made an effort to confirm that the person is who they say they are. And even that can be followable. Social media outlets can make a mistake doing that. 
Okay, let's look at the content itself. We can see that she is linking out to her sources. That is a positive signal. Um, you might want to run a check on the sources themselves. We can also see that she is quoting people with titles that would indicate that they are experts. So for example, this person is said to be um, a doctor on the faculty of the University of Connecticut. Um, and we find a profile that indicates that yes, he is that. Um, you know, things can be faked. Um, again, no one detail means you should trust something. This is a positive signal, but also just because something says .edu doesn't mean you can trust it. People can fake that too. And now let's look at the image to see um, if it's used in proper context. So we're gonna right click, go to search Google for image, and we can see that the image has been associated with other articles on similar topics. So um, this has to do with coronavirus here. Um, we can see that there is the thumbnail. I'm not gonna spend extensive time on this, but we could dig deeper. We could Google the photojournalist who took the image, for example. Okay. So we have seen positive signals indicating that this is a, an article that we can trust. Um, no one detail is enough to, to indicate that you can trust something, but all the signals we've seen have been positive. So let's talk about why misinformation would be common during the coronavirus pandemic. Biggest reason is probably that we don't know everything about this virus yet. So people want greater certainty than they're able to get. And so that might make people want to share these things that are just copy pasted because it comforts them and they think it will help other people, even though it isn't supported or it's blatantly false. <laughs> Again, no single source is perfect. Even trustworthy news organizations make mistakes. And for the best information, you should read multiple trustworthy sources. The health minister of France put out um, a warning saying that um, medications like ibuprofen aggravate COVID-19. And um, the Guardian covered it just as, well, this person said this, and they didn't do further vetting on that. Later, different outlets looked deeper into the claim, and they found that there wasn't strong support for that. Cross-check your information. Uh, if you see something, check and see if other outlets are reporting the same thing.